And it is officially 6.30 and we have all commissioners here. So when you are ready to begin. Perfect, great. Um, I call the meeting to uh, planning commission meeting of the city of American Canyon, November 17th, 2022 to order 6.30. Um, Nicole, get a roll call please. Yes. Um, co excuse me. Commissioner Navarro. Here. Commissioner Goff. Present. Vice Chair Wong. Present. Chair Malari. Here. And Commissioner Altman is absent this evening. Okay, perfect. I'm trying to pull up the agenda, which I had. Okay, uh, now this session uh, section is open for us to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you guys can come along with me and say Pledge of Allegiance, that'd be great. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, um, this time now is open up for uh, public comment. Uh, it's reserved for members of the public to address the city of American Canyon of any interests that are not on the agenda and are within the subject matter uh, jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. Uh, Nicole, do we have any public comment? We do. We have Beth Marcus. Ms. Marcus, I'm going to unmute you or ask you to unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. I just want to uh, say early happy Thanksgiving to you and the best of luck to you. Fantastic that you've got, what, 17, 18 people who have applied for your planning commission. That's outstanding. It's good to see that our community is really out there and really wanting to get a, a part of what you're doing. And thank you for those of you who will be leaving uh, for all your service. And again, just congratulations on getting so many applicants. Okay. And now we have Justin Hamilton Hole. Justin, please unmute yourself. Oh, good, Amy, and happy. Thank any very um this is our last day me. Um we just want to shout out. I think I have somebody did call me for my uh more update about the three house or five house at Russell Karen Dunmore. Um and this I see Erica the happy wish to Happy taking to all. Right. Um, and let's see, it, does anybody else have any public comment on anything that is not on the agenda? Justin, you just raised your hand again. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, again, any public comment for anything that is not on the agenda this evening? Going once, twice. I believe that is the end of, um, or nobody else has any public comment for non-agendized items. Great, thank you. Um, any agenda changes? Director Cooper. Thank you, uh, Chair Malari. We have no agenda changes tonight. Sounds good, all right. Uh, moving on to the consent calendar. Um, looking for a recommendation to approve the minutes of our September 22nd, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting. I'll second. Roll call, please. Yes, um, Commissioner Navarro. Um, aye. Commissioner Goff. Aye. Commissioner Altman is absent. Vice Chair Wong? Aye. And Chair Malari? Aye. Perfect. Thank you so much. 
All right, next on the uh, consent calendar is the 2020 through 2023 Planning Commission meeting calendar. Commissioner Galt? Yeah, I was reviewing those dates and I have a question on the February date. It's listed as the 22nd, which is a Wednesday. Our meetings are generally on Thursdays. I'm wondering if that should be the 23rd. It should be the 23rd and I will amend that. Thank you. Any other comments from the commissioners? Okay, looking to get an approval for the agenda or the planning commission calendar dates for 2023. I'll make a motion to approve the 2023 planning commission meeting calendar. <laughs> I'll second. Thank you. Nicole Wilcox, please. Yes. Commissioner Goff. Aye. Commissioner Navarro. Aye. Commissioner Altman is absent. Vice Chair Wong. Aye. And Chair Mallory. Aye. Perfect. All right. So moving on down to the public hearings, uh, the Giovannini Logistics Center Warehouse Project. And I believe we have a presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Chair Malari and Planning Commission. I'm Brent Cooper, Community Development Director, and uh, we're pleased to present the Givanoni Logistics Center. Um, this project is um, uh, a, a large industrial project, 208 acres, very similar to the Napa Logistics Park, just to the north of that. Um, let's see, there are two people I see in attendees. Nicole, if you could promote them to panelists. Um, <laughs> the Grant Gruber and Mary Bean, they're um, our EAR consultants for this project. I know they're part of the presentation. Okay, I am doing that right now. Um, the Planning Commission last summer um, reviewed the environmental impact report for this project uh, while it was during the public comment period. Um, after that, it closed. Um, we uh, received the comments and prepared responses to them. Um, and they were sent out um, on uh, November 4th and a modification with additional information on November 11th. Um, the standard that's required is 10 days before the EIR is certified, which would occur by the city council. So we're well ahead of schedule there. I do apologize. Um, the uh, planning commission packet inadvertently um, didn't include the resolution to approve uh, and uh, recommend approval of the environment impact report, all of the substantial information is in the packet. Um, that oversight was mine. Um, and I have nothing to say that I'm really sorry it wasn't in the packet. Um, I did email it to the planning commissioners um, and our ER consultants um, just before this meeting. I know that we had some back and forth to um, refine it. And, and so uh, it's largely a documentation uh, referencing the information that was included in the packet. I'm happy to screen share if that's uh, appropriate at the right time. Um, the uh, Our ER consultant, First Carbon, um, has a presentation on the environmental impact report process and uh, outcomes. And um, the applicant has a presentation to describe the project. Um, following that, staff will be available for questions. Um, this is a public hearing. And uh, so, of course, there are, are people probably in the attendees that would like to speak as well. And with that, um, if it's um, ready to go, I'm going to turn it over to, I see Grant's face. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Grant, although I see Mary is also here, also from First Carbon Solutions. And I do also want to just uh, point out, of course, we always have our city attorney, which I appreciate very much. And, um, but we don't always get the public works director so very happy to have uh, Erica here as well. Um, and so um, I think we're well attended. So thank you everybody for being here tonight. And I guess Grant, if you can um, uh, share your screen, Do you, are you the one with the presentation that's available? Brett, this is Joe Leviage with Buzzotes. Uh, we have an RRN and we can okay. change the slides for, for Grant. 
So I, we passed the first, hi, this is Jeff Lenhart with RMW. I'm the architect of the project. Uh, so happy to be in front of you tonight. Uh, we're gonna do our best to navigate the technology here. It sounds like you can already hear us. So we're past the first hurdle. Um, I'm gonna try and share screen and see if this works. So bear with me for a second while I get this going. Can you guys see that okay? Yes, we can. Great. Great. <clears throat> Grant, would you like to take us? Can Grant hear us? Grant, I can't tell if you're talking, but we can't hear you. Grant, I've asked you to unmute yourself. We've lost his video on our end as well. It looks like his screen's just gone blank because according to my screen, he's showing video. Oh. So. Okay. Uh, should we give him a moment? Oh, there he's, he's coming back. back. Grant, you here now? And this this is Mary. If um, sorry, if if Grant doesn't get back on, then I can walk through the. Can you hear me? Presentation. Yep, we can hear you. Oh. Okay, I think my my video is screwing up. Um, so if we can start the presentation. No worries. Here we go. Grant, can you see that? Yes, I can. Fantastic. I think we're good to go. You let me know when you want to advance. Let's advance. Well, good evening, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Grant Gruber. I'm with FCS. We're the city's uh, the, the consultant for the environmental impact report. I'm joined by Mary Bean, who uh, you just heard from. So we're just gonna give you a, a basic rundown through the project, and then we'll talk about the environmental review. So the site is 208 acres. It's between Green Island Road and Napa Logistics Park. It's flat, it's got grassy vegetation, and a, a reach of No Name Creek runs through the northern portion of the site. It is in the American Canyon city limits. It's been there since 2005. It's been designated industrial by both the general plan and zoning ordinance. And it's also within the Napa County Airport land use compatibility plan boundaries. Continue. That's an aerial. So just orient yourself. You got the airport to the north. You got the uh, railroad line to the west. You have Napa Logistics Park, which uh, in that photo is, uh, is early phases of it. It's obviously been built out more. You got 29 to the east. Continue. So Buzz Oats is proposing to develop 2.4 million square feet of logistics center uses on the site. Phase one is roughly 95 acres, two high cube warehouses, roughly 470,000 square feet, the other 628,000 square feet. That would be developed east of Devlin Road. And phase two, which is up around 113 acres, would be up to 1.3 million square feet. And vehicular access would come from both Green Island Road and the, actually, now it's the existing Devlin Road extension. And that's the site plan. And again, that's phase one to the right. The reason that is laid out is because the applicant has actually uh, developed, we've evaluated it as a project level. The reason you don't see anything on the left side is because that is still conceptual. Applicant is going to base the, the layout based on things such as resource agency, permitting requirements and whatnot. Continuing. So the California Environmental Quality Act known as CEQA applies to projects that require discretionary approval from state or local agencies. So in this case, the city of American Canyon because the applicant has filed an application with the city of American Canyon is the lead agency and has overseen the preparation of an environmental impact report. So, 
give you a little background about EIRs, it is the highest level of SQL review. It is an impartial informational document. It does not advocate for the project one way or another. And it evaluates the project as proposed. In other words, it represents the worst case scenario in terms of environmental impacts. And I make that point because for instance, Napa Logistics to the north evaluated a lot more square footage than was actually entitled and actually ends up getting developed. And then it also sets forth mitigation measures to reduce the severity of potentially significant impacts. So how did we get here? Process began all the way back in January of 2021 with the notice of preparation. This is the very first document in the whole process. It announces that the city was embarking on the preparation of an EIR. February 3rd, we held a virtual scoping meeting. On February 10th of 2021, the NOP review period closed. Then fast forward to May of this year, the draft EIR was issued for public review. June 23rd, before this very body, uh, we also held a virtual uh, public meeting on the draft EIR where we solicited public input about what was contained in the document. And then finally, the public review period closed on July 20th of this year, and it ends up being a total of 62 days. Now, I should note the state law only requires 45 days, so we exceeded that by 17 days. On Halloween, the final EIR was released, and tonight we're having the Planning Commission. So to give you some big picture context, this part of American Canyon has seen a lot of development activity, and me personally and my company, we were involved in the preparation and the ultimate certification of these EIRs for Napa Logistics Park Phase 2, Napa Airport Corporate Center, and the Broadway District specifically. And so based on this past history, we know coming into this, there would be about five issues we'd have to address. And air quality and greenhouse gas emissions, you know, biological resources, specifically wetlands, uh, compatibility with the Napa County Airport, traffic, especially on 29, and finally water supply. So the draft EIR, which is a fairly thick document, we evaluated 13 topical issues in depth. And again, some of the same issues I just mentioned. The EIR set forth 32 mitigation measures. I'll just hit some of the highlights. Best management practices for air quality and greenhouse gas emissions, no net loss of wetlands, uh, Wildlife Attractant Management Plan, that's for the airport to ensure that, you know, bird strikes uh, are not being created and uh, noise abatement during construction. We also looked at three project alternatives. So what we found was the project would result in two significant unavoidable air quality impacts. First is conflicts with the air quality management plan. And that's tied to the next one, which is cumulative criteria pollutant impact. So because anytime you develop you know, a certain amount of acreage, especially once you get into the millions of square feet, 2.4 million square feet, it just is inevitable you're going to have significant air quality impacts just because of how the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has set its thresholds. And because you have a significant impact with exceeding thresholds, that then automatically triggers an impact with the air quality management. By no means, this is not unexpected. In fact, we had the same conclusion in those other EIRs I mentioned, Apple Logistics, Napa Airport Corporate Center and Broadway District. The good news is all other impacts we evaluated in that EIR are less than significant and do not require, or are less than significant with mitigation or less than significant and did not require mitigation. Bless you. So during the 62 day public review period, uh, first off, we'll start off at the June 23rd Planning Commission. There were five verbal comments received, including three from planning commissioners. Then if you're talking written comments, we had two from public agencies, one written comment from a tribal organization, and finally three written comments from private parties. And so just to hit the highlights here, there are a lot of topics, but the ones that were reoccurring that came up a lot was Swainson Sock. Uh, finally, a new, the need for a new North Fire Station, vehicle miles traveled, and lastly, air quality mitigation. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these topics in the next couple of slides. So Swainson's hawk, uh, just to give you a little background about this species, it was uh, very much in peril circa the late 1970s, early 80s. It has historically been in the Central Valley, but there is a small population in Southern Napa County. 
So we've known about the Swainson talk and its potential, uh, you know, to occur in American Canyon for a number of years. Um, I would just point out that this site has been the most biologically studied site in American Canyon in the past five years. Uh, several different biologists, including folks from different firms, so not, it's not just the same people. Uh, they've studied the site and all come back to the same conclusions. Um, for the Swainson talk, this is a species that nests in trees. Even though we don't have any trees on the site, we still have pre-construction surveys as mitigation. That's nesting surveys. Then you also have the issue that the Swainson hawk is a raptor, so it forages for uh, uh, its uh, food. So amphibians, rodents, reptiles, other birds. Because the site provides suitable foraging habitat, we also consider that. Well, the issue is that the Swainson hawk is a very adaptable species. And if you're going to require this site to mitigate for Swainson hawk, you know, you'd pretty much have to require every site in American Canyon to mitigate just because the species is so adaptable. So we concluded that this is unnecessary because there is so much available foraging habitat, especially in areas that are going to be preserved as open space in and around American Canyon. So uh, moving on to the new North Fire Station. During the public review period, the American Canyon Fire Protection District submitted a letter saying that there's going to be a need for a new fire station. That being said, no sites have been selected from what, what I last heard. They're still doing a study as to what facility needs they have. Uh, nonetheless, this applicant has entered into an agreement with the Fire Protection District to provide funding to cover uh, operational uh, issues with the site. And continuing to vehicle miles travel. VM, as we call it VMT, this is a relatively new area of CEQA similar to greenhouse gas emissions from about 15 years ago. It is this brand new area that has been evolving. So you get guidance that's all over the place. Some agencies have guidance, other agencies don't have guidance. When you don't have guidance, you end up in kind of this uh, no man's land of trying to figure out what the right thing to do. On top of that, warehouse projects, there's virtually nothing out there for them. So in the absence, and then on top of that, the Napa Solano traffic model has some limitations, specifically that trips can't go across county lines and whatnot. So in the absence, you know, of clear guidance of these limits with, you know, technology and whatnot, our traffic consultant, W uh, Trans, they use the best available information and the best guidance to evaluate VMT impact. And so they were using information from like San Jose, Sacramento, the governor's office of planning and research, which is the agency that oversees CEQA, and said basically what, what makes the most sense for this type of project. And last week, we would get to air quality mitigation. And we had two organizations that provided a lengthy laundry list of feasible mitigation measures. And so we went through each and every one of these proposed mitigation measures. And what we found was that, A, a lot of them were not necessary because, for instance, construction air quality emissions could be mitigated to a level of less than significant. And under CEQA, you don't need to do additional mitigation when you can get it to that level. Two, we already had it as a mitigation measure. Or three, they were just not feasible and rendered the project unbuildable. So we did, though, take three mitigation measures proposed. And just to give you one example, one of them was posting signs in the loading docks advising truck drivers that the state has a law limiting uh, diesel idling to <clears> five <throat> minutes or less. So we said, OK, fine, we'll play ball. And if you have something that's feasible and makes sense, we'll include it. Continuing. So uh, now the applicant team will take over with the presentation, but looking ahead here, the city will open the public hearing to solicit verbal comments on the EIR. And then finally, Planning Commission will be acting as a recommend body to the City Council regarding certification of the final one. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Chair Malloy, members of the Planning Commission, good evening. I'm Joe Levayich with Buzz Oats. We are the applicant and developer of the Giovanoni Logistics Center. And before we get into some of the project specifics, uh, I just want to take a moment to thank staff uh, for getting here tonight. We've been working at this for, for over two years, and I know it's not a, an easy lift. Uh, so thanks again, and we're, we're looking forward to the presentation. So we could go uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Buzz Oats, we're a, a vertically integrated 
real estate company. What does that mean? Why does that matter? Uh, we're not your average developer in that a lot of developers will take raw land and title it and sell it to somebody else. And that next person will come and build on a site. And then that next person will sell that. And then someone will buy that and manage it over the long term. Uh, we do all of that. And why that matters is when we look at a site, we're, we're not looking at um, what the next one year, two years is going to bring. We're looking at this really on a 50 plus year time horizon. Uh, we buy raw land and entitle it. Uh, we will install infrastructure uh, in that land and surrounding area. We will act as the general contractor and build on that land. Uh, we will find high quality tenants to lease those buildings. And then we will manage those assets over the long term. Uh, so the commitment that we're making on this property with uh, the Giovanoni family and right from the start under a ground lease, uh, we're looking at a hundred year commitment to the city of American Canyon and ultimately this site. This is our first or second project in American Canyon, our first being 100 Jim Oswalt. And so uh, generally speaking, I think that, that you'll find that uh, we do things the right way and we are, uh, we're not the typical developer that will take a piece of land and, and flip it. Let me go to the next slide, please. A little bit about our company founded in 1951 by uh, Buzz Oates. And he was a, a war veteran that came back and uh, started a, a key shop. And that key shop was was a a Key Shop. And I think I maybe shared this last time. He was a smart businessman. The reason why he did that was that was going to be the first name in the phone book that you saw uh, when you looked for a key shop. Uh, so that transformed into building supplies, then construction, then development. And uh, 75 years later, we're a company with 101 employees, uh, geographic location, typically Northern California, Central Valley. Uh, we're doing projects in Northern Nevada. We have some holdings in El Paso, Texas, as well as uh, Tucson, Arizona. Next slide, please. A little bit about kind of the portfolio. Uh, we have a, a mix of tenants. You know, two thirds are, are national tenants and another third our regional and local tenants. Uh, we've built everything from a Starbucks drive through all the way to a million square foot warehouse office projects. Uh, but this site is obviously industrial warehouse. And we think we're, we're, we're taking the project to another level and things that uh, we just haven't seen in this, in this space yet. Next slide, please. <clears throat> just a few completed projects to give you a sense, kind of look and feel of what we do. Next slide. Uh, this project here was down in, in Lathrop, started out as a 600,000 square foot spec building, meaning speculative. We don't have tenants at the time. 95% of what we do is on a speculative basis. Uh, we feel that we have a good sense of what the market desires. So we will take the risk and invest millions of dollars on both site improvements, construction. And what we're seeing now is, is kind of the market gets going once you're under construction. Right? We, we do build the suits for tenants, but uh, once walls are going up, then tenants get interested. And that's what happened to this facility that uh, we leased to Tesla. It started out as a spec building and then turned into a build the suit once we were under construction. Next slide, please. Uh, similar to an Amazon facility, uh, this is in Sacramento and Metro Air Park. Uh, this is our 1,200 acre business park uh, directly adjacent to the Sacramento International Airport. I think this was our first building in the park. Uh, this park took 40 years to, uh, to make. Uh, hopefully the Giovanni, Giovanoni Logistics Center does not take that long, uh, but we invested $100 million in infrastructure prior to, to tilting a wall. Uh, so again, it just shows our commitment in the long term to both an individual site, a park, and the communities in which we work in. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a local project in Vacaville completed earlier this year. Uh, it's a local paper company and a 204,000 square foot building. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Giovanoni Logistics Center, uh, we feel that from our design and the commitments that we're making to the city and the park, uh, this is really the most environmentally sustainable logistics center in Napa County 
and Northern California. Uh, we feel what we're proposing here with this park, you're just not seeing yet in the market and we are trying to future-proof the park uh, given that we are committed in the long term. And I'm gonna go over a, a few things of what we are doing. Next slide, please. Uh, as you guys know, this is the largest infill opportunity in the city of American Canyon. I think this was first contemplated back in the 1986 Napa Airport specific plan. Uh, the city annexed it in 2005. And so we know that this warrants uh, what is really setting the bar as to what these projects can be. And uh, we feel that this is really a sustainability showcase project that the rest of the market can take as an example of how we can do these projects in a way that works for everyone. Next slide, please. Um, we project that at build out, the park will have over 2000 jobs. And again, we base that on a square foot basis, but also kind of what we see uh, developing millions of square feet and uh, managing close to 30 million square feet of warehouse. Uh, again, this is a big commitment that we're making to the city. Uh, we project over $400 million in private capital that we're going to be investing over the long term. Uh, this park isn't going to build out in a year. You know, we, we think it's probably going to be 10 years or more. Uh, but again, when we look at the commitment that we're making today, plus the long term, uh, we had an economic impact study conducted and EPS out of Sacramento uh, is projecting that in total Napa County, uh, economic impact with payroll and spending that we're looking at roughly $800 million in e economic impact throughout Napa County. So again, uh, we, we, we are making that commitment because we feel that, yes, it's a risk, uh, but we are making that investment uh, not from a year, but we're looking at 50, 60 years from now and how this works out. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the project features that we're really proud about um, we're committing to net zero energy use. And um, that's something that I don't think you're seeing park wide on a, on a two and a half million square foot park, right? Uh, we hope to achieve that all through on site solar generation. We've also committed to not bringing natural gas to buildings at all. So these are going to be all electric buildings with on site generation. Uh, I think as important as anything in the uh, current water climate that we have with uh, the feds and state cutting allocations, uh, water being obviously precious in all scenarios, but especially now in a drought scenario, uh, our water use is projected to be 75% served by recycled water from the investment that the city's making on uh, being able to treat that and bring it back into the system. Uh, but this is this was kind of shocking to me. Uh, we're using 133 and a half acre feet less than what was already allocated for to this site in the urban water management plan. Now, if we take, you know, two households uh, typically use an acre foot of water a year. This is a you know this is a subdivision of 260 homes. I, you know, it did, it's kind of hard to fathom, but it we we feel. Uh, when you look at warehouse projects, logistic centers, commerce centers, as compared to uh, other land uses that unequivocally, this land use is the most efficient from a resource standpoint uh, with water, energy use, sewer use compared to any other land use. Uh, we're also making the commitment to enhanced EV charging. Uh, we're committing to tier two Cal Green charging, which I believe is up to 40% of spaces for autos will be uh, EV ready. And we're also uh, gonna have a clean fleet ready for, uh, for truck fleets when that technology is readily available in the market. Um, we know that there's some prototypes out there now, uh, but we are, we're future-proofing the part to bring the conduit necessary to uh, serve that when it's available. And we are also making the commitment for uh, plugins at each dock door uh, for any refrigeration trucks. So we, we don't have emissions from idling. Next slide, please. Uh, also of importance, when we look at our phase one, uh, phase one from a land perspective 
is going to be 65% committed to both conservation and wetland creation. 30% um, of the site overall will be under permanent conservation easement, uh, 45 acre preservation area that we're gonna offset some minor impacts to phase one and create some wetlands within that area that is going to provide connectivity to Napa Logistics Park and their uh, preservation area. We're also going to be extending the Napa Valley Vine Trail through our frontage on Green Island Road and Devlin, um, increasing public access throughout the city. Next slide, please. Uh, as Grant mentioned, uh, we've worked with the fire district to ensure that they have the resources necessary uh, to serve our park. Uh, we're committing to $158,000 a year at build out uh, that ensures that uh, the fire district is going to have the personnel and equipment necessary uh, to serve this park at build out. Uh, also of importance when we look at, at VMT, uh, you know, typically I think what jurisdictions are striving for is 15% uh, below a regional average, and we're doubling that, right? We're nearly 30% below what the Bay Area average is for auto VMT. We've also gone a step above uh, truck trips and related VMT is, is not a requirement of CEQA. But we did get a comment on that, and we said, hey, let's, let's find what our truck VMT is actually going to be. So uh, we took data that takes aggregated cell phone data. So it's actual trips. It's not projections, it's not modeling. And we looked at uh, similar logistics facilities throughout the Bay Area, uh, the nine county, entire Bay Area, uh, and compared it to both some data captured in the Central Valley, as well as uh, data captured Napa Logistics Park, Napa Corporate Center and others, and Farron Piers, who probably is the most respected uh, transportation consultant in the industry concluded that our truck VMT is going to be nearly 40% below the Bay Area average. And we know that trips from trucks coming out of the Napa region are, are more regional in nature. And so again, uh, we think that we're setting the bar as far as sustainability goes for what a logistics center can be. Um, next, I wanna pass it over to Jeff Landhart with RMW who is the architect on the project, and he's gonna walk you through a video simulation of phase one and how this looks. And thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, before I go to the simulation, I, and it goes pretty fast, so I wanna make sure I have a moment to talk about uh, the challenge and the opportunity that uh, Bozo's presented to us as architects and designers. Uh, it's not often that a developer, particularly with industrial projects, will come to us and say, we really want you to spread your wings on this project. We want to do something that exceeds what the current bar is. We want you to push that bar beyond where it currently has been. We want you to we want to see what you can do to really push us into territory that's not been really explored yet. So um, that was a both a challenge and a great opportunity and something we really appreciated. And I hope that uh, what I'm about to show you uh, kind of demonstrates that we've done our best to get there. We're starting with a view that looks to the west and we see Highway 29 down at the southern side of the bottom of the screen here. And, and in a moment, we'll see the development appear here. You can see the two buildings we're proposing. Next, we're gonna move to a view from Green Island Road at the bottom of the screen, where we're looking to the, to the north and we can see the Napa development and the other context buildings and our development will appear here in a moment. Next, we're gonna show you the project you know, so this kind of bird's eye view uh, one more time from uh, a view from Devlin Road at the bottom of the screen here, looking to the east where we see Highway 29 in the distance. And the development will appear here in a moment. And just briefly, we'll get a little closer to the buildings. So you can see some of the architectural treatments and uh, design elements that we've proposed here. And we've proposed a, a squarely modern and tailored design that we think does a really good job of elevating the possibilities and the potential of tilt up concrete into something that you don't normally see where it sort of dispels the, the, the curse that we typically see on tilt ups well beyond the blue stripe and other tired motifs that have been tried and burned on these projects. This is something that I think everybody can, can support <laughs> and, and appreciate as a development that really pushes the upper limits. 
of what's possible with this type of construction. I hope you guys will agree, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have or respond to anything you've got for us. And thank you again for your time. We appreciate it greatly. Yeah, and, and thanks, Jeff. And, and just of note, maybe you guys noticed on the on the site plan there, um, but we we tried really hard to master plan this phase one, and we'll be master planning the entire part to to separate auto and truck traffic, right? Uh, where employees are going to enter in a separate driveway, separate parking field, as opposed to you know mixing trucks and autos, and we're just seeing that as kind of the standard now in the market, right? That um, this isn't everyone mixing together and hopefully everything works out. We, we are uh, doing this on purpose to, to make this function more as a, as a typical business park, office park than you would, you know, what you think of industrial is, uh, as smokestacks and, and dirty uses. This is, this is not that, right? And so uh, we think that we're, we're trying to take it to the next level of what these sites can be. Uh, also, before we get into questions, uh, we do have uh, Bill Campton on the line, who uh, is a representative of the, the Givanoni family, and right from the start, the the nonprofit that uh, that holds the land. And maybe Bill can just speak to a little bit about uh, the history, how we got here, and uh, any other comments he would like to share. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh chair and commission thank you for allowing us to be here tonight and for me to have a couple minutes um i serve as one of the three people on a foundation called right from the start right from the start was a foundation created by albert Givanoni. uh albert uh was known he grew up in napa a couple of brothers browns Valley market Givanoni's market they're pretty well known but albert never married never had any kids and he bought this property Oh, I bet he probably bought it 60 years ago or maybe even 70 years ago. And in the later years of his life, Albert had a goal that he wanted to take this property and do something special with it. So two of his nephews, Michael Givanoni, Tom Givanoni, and myself, along with Albert, created a foundation called Right From The Start. And what Albert Givanoni did is upon his death, he donated all 200 acres to the foundation with the specific goal of the foundation to fund Catholic education uh, grades K through 12 in the Santa Rosa Diocese or to help Catholic education in the Santa Rosa Diocese in other ways. Um, Albert believed in uh, if you want to make the world a better place, you do it through education. And so he entrusted us with this property to, to move on with it and to basically grant his wish of trying to educate and make the world a better place. Um, we probably started 15 years ago and kind of teeing the property up and working with American Canyon uh, to bring this online. And it's been a great relationship with the city of American Canyon. We got Devlin Road in. We worked on Green Island, Green Island Road together. We worked on the sewer line and the sewer pump station going through. And uh, Jason Holly put in a lot of sweat with us, and it was a great relationship. When it came time to choose a developer for the site, um, Albert had a specific wish. He uh, wanted us to do a ground lease and not sell the property outright to a developer. Albert believed that um, if we hold on to the land, then we'll get the property back at some point. And that way we'll continue to always fund Catholic education for, you know, basically indefinitely. We went and talked to several developers and, and it wasn't easy because of the ground lease situation. Most developers want to buy the land. They don't want to mess with a ground lease. Uh, Buzz Oats was a development company that we've heard about. And when we met, uh, it was it was a very, very good conversation. Uh, they cared about what we were doing as our mission. They were open to the idea of a ground lease and the quality of their developments and the quality of their people were kind of the kind of made it an easy choice for us to pick oats to work with. Uh, through this process, which has been a long process since we just we signed with them, uh, they have been fantastic with us. They've helped us with things in the foundation that they've had they haven't had to help us with. And uh, it's a it's an organization that we're proud to be partnered with for 99 years. So uh, we hope that uh, this project comes across well to the commission. Uh, we look forward to it because as soon as they start building, that's that's uh, I'll just say it bluntly, that's more money that we're going to have to donate. And Michael Givanoni, Tom Givanoni, and myself, none of us get paid. That was one of Albert's wishes. We can't we can't get paid for being on the foundation. Basically, almost 100% of the ground lease money that we get from Oats will go will go to the Catholic Foundation. 
And so, uh, like I said, we're excited to see the project move forward and we're excited to start doing some pretty special things once we do get that income. And I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the family, the foundation, or the property itself. And I appreciate again, the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, just in summary, before we give it back, uh, this is something that we're, we're really excited about. Uh, we have the ability to be flexible on the type of users that that landed this part, right? If you see a big building, you think, oh, it, it, you know, it's just gonna be logistics. Well, these buildings can demise down to much smaller sizes. Um, you know, I'll give you a story of, of Metro Air Park in Sacramento, where we had a 100,000 square foot shell. You know, oh, you know, it's a concrete box. You know, what are you gonna do there? And at construction, uh, we got a call from a company out of the Bay Area called Orca Biosciences. And they do cancer research for rare cancers. And they're, they're literally, you know, have a clean room where they're doing reverse atom spinning. And you wouldn't think that typically of a warehouse building, right? But I think what you're finding now is, is more flexible uses and companies that, uh, yes, logistics is a component, uh, but really it's, it's advanced manufacturing, it's biotech, uh, it's all the things that typically would have done in a lab or an office that are now coming into what you would consider a warehouse building. And again, uh, we look forward to attracting those high quality tenants to the city. And uh, with that, we open up the questions and uh, what can we share about us and the project specifics. So thank you. Um, and, and Chair Malari, that uh, concludes um, presentation. Um, ready for questions? Perfect. Any commissioner items or comments now? We can open up for a public comment. Commissioner. No, well, we can open up public comment for him. If you have public comment on this item, please raise your hand now. Okay. Um, we have Chris, we have a number of people raising their hands. I'm going to try and go in the order that people raise their hands. Chris James. Uh, good evening, um, everyone this evening. Um, uh, thanks for bringing this to the, to the planning commission this evening. Um, Exciting to see such a big development happening in the city, um, and the, you know some of the, the information in the presentation. I like, wanted to pick up on the EV charging, and especially around trucks and etc. I was at a, um, a recent. Um, it was kind of a combined event with with the city around EVs, and the MCE was there, our local energy provider, and they were talking about um, when developments happening. I'm sure you're thinking about this, or it's already in the plan. It's but it's more than just the conduit and you know providing you know th that but it's also working with pg e anticipating down the road where these transformers down the line need to be sized accordingly and if it's not planned out ahead it, um it's, it's often awkward to, to upgrade these things and i know you 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 develop these massive projects etc but it's something to keep in mind if it's in short order we're going to see these things so i'm hoping that we are working with pg e to make sure that it's just more than you know availability of conduit, but it's the, the transformers and what's down the line and being pumped into close nearby um, that we can accommodate all those those big trucks that are going to be coming in and being flipped over to electric, hopefully in the short order. Especially you talk about these projects going to be, you know, fifty to hundred year projects. Um, so it's you know, but I think in short order we're going to see um, the explosion of EV trucks, um, and it's exciting to see that you're willing to support that. Okay, um, good luck with the project. Thanks. Okay, next we have Francis Tinney. Good evening. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to make comments tonight. And thank you to Mr. Cooper, who talked to me about, um, about this meeting earlier today. Um, so my name is Francis Tinney, and I'm a legal fellow with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, and the center is a nonprofit public interest environmental organization 
that's dedicated to um, protecting native species and their habitats um, through science policy and environmental law. And we have over 98,000 members throughout California and the United States. And the center has worked for many years to protect the environment and quality of life for people in Napa County. And we've been following this project in particular since February 9th, uh, 2021, when we submitted comments on the notice of preparation. And so we've now reviewed the final environmental impact report for the project, and we intend to submit written comments on it. And we're concerned about some of the environmental problems um, that we've seen with this project and, and some problems we've seen with the environmental review process. Um, so first, the EIR understates and doesn't properly mitigate the project's impacts to sensitive species, um, such as the Swainson's hawk and golden eagle, or its impacts to significant wetlands. Second, the project's greenhouse gas emissions aren't properly analyzed um, because, among other things, the EIR uses an inappropriate threshold of significance. Third, the project doesn't adopt all feasible mitigation measures for impacts to air quality or uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions, um, including measures that are recommended by the California Attorney General um, and that are standard for other warehouse projects, like requiring rooftop solar and the use of all electric equipment on site. Uh, for the, these reasons and others, we're concerned about the lasting environmental consequences of this project for the people, species, and ecosystems of American Canyon. We urge the Planning Commission to recommend not approving this project unless and until these deficiencies are remedied. Um, thanks so much. Okay. Next, we have Richard Franco. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to present this evening. My name is Richard Franco. I'm speaking on behalf of Napa Solano residents for responsible development. We submitted some preliminary written comments earlier today um, addressing the city's continued failure to adequately analyze and mitigate the project's significant environmental impacts. And I just want to summarize a few uh, key issues here. Um, first, I wanted to address uh, an issue involving significant new information that requires that the EIR be revised and recirculated for further public review. Um, we have a wildlife biologist consultant who made a site visit last week and observed a new gravel road cutting across the western portion of the property from north to south and cutting directly across the proposed wetlands mitigation area and very close to No Name Creek in the northwest corner of the property. Uh, this road is not disclosed in the, e in the DEIR or the final EIR, does not appear on any of the site maps, drawings, or diagrams. Um, and the EIR must be revised to disclose and explain what this is, what it's been used for, as well as the environmental impacts associated with its construction and use, and whether it will impact the ability of the site to uh, preserve or to, to mitigate the wetlands impacts on that northern portion of the site. Um, with respect to vehicle miles traveled, um, the VMT analysis in the EIR is deficient. Uh, the estimated VMT for the, uh, for the project of 16.24 miles was purportedly generated using the California statewide travel demand model, but none of the calculations or the inputs any of the information uh, going into that model to derive that number was provided in the DEIR or the FEIR. It's essentially a black box. There's no uh, analysis made available to the public so that uh, that, that number can be evaluated. Um, the, the Hiding this analysis from the public is a, a violation of CEQA. Um, finally, I wanted to touch on the, um, the wetlands uh, issues we've commented both in the, on the DEIR as well as uh, in our preliminary FEIR comments about uh, the complete lack of a functional wetlands analysis, which is necessary, critical, and, and indispensable in order Mr. to- Mr. Franco, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, it's in, indispensable to be able to actually assess what the impacts of the project on the existing wetlands will be and whether the project will be able to adequately mitigate those impacts. Thank you very much. We urge the Planning Commission to not uh, send this to the City Council until a revised and uh, recirculated EIR is done. Thank you.
Does anybody else have comments? Please raise your hand at this time. Going once. We do still have several people in attendance. If you would like to make comment, please raise your hand. Um, nobody is raising their hand. Thank you, Nicole. I'm going to go ahead and close up the comment. Where are we getting? I'm not sure where we're getting feedback. Chair Malari, could you please unmute yourself, I think? Yeah, we're getting feedback from your end somehow. How about now? It's better. There's still a little bit, but it's better. All right, so we close public comment. Uh, move on to uh, the presenters potentially to comment on any of the comments that were presented to us. I, I'm sorry, I, I was getting feedback. I didn't hear what you said. Chair I'd like to give the opportunity for the presenters to first oh. any of the comments that were presented in the public comment section. I'd be happy to. Uh, so I, I, I want to make available uh, Jim Moose, who is our CEQA counsel, is on the line, as well as Robert Ferreira, our biologist. Um, I mean, should the questions come from planning commissioners or uh, is it the desire of the planning commission for us to respond directly to public comment? I think it would be in the best interest if you were to respond to the, the public comments currently. Okay. Uh, I will I will defer to our council on this issue. I know that there was a letter that came in at like 515 that was about 100 pages, uh, but I'll, I'll defer to, to Jim Moose. Good evening, commissioners. I did get a chance to read the uh, letter from Mr. Franco, which came in uh, late this afternoon. Uh, it looked to me to be reminiscent of many of the uh, points that he and his consultants had made on the draft EIR, to which there were uh, very thorough responses in the final EIR. Uh, it sounds like there may be uh, another letter coming from the Center for Biological Diversity. I haven't seen that but I am familiar with the uh, comments they filed on the draft EIR. Uh, so I can't assess the, uh, the merits of any additional comments, but my, my general uh, thought is that uh, there is time between uh, this meeting and the city council meeting uh, for first carbon and uh, biologists who are working on the project to sort through all the, uh, the new commentary and to uh, be able to advise the city council as, uh, as to whether there may be some potential merit to any of it. I wouldn't expect, frankly, uh, any uh, le true legal deficiencies to be identified, but uh, I didn't see anything in the Adams Broadwell letter that uh, suggested that uh, the commission ought not to proceed tonight. Thank you, Mr. Moon, I appreciate it. <coughs> Chair Wall. Thank you, Chair Merlari. I, I would like to follow up on one of the public comments. Um, Mr. Franco, in his written public comment, and I'm glad that he did join us today to repeat his public comment because I didn't get a chance to really do more than scan his, his letter, but I was interested in one point he made about a new gravel road that's across the wetlands mitigation area. Um, I'm curious if this is a new development or if this was something that he had previously asked about in an earlier public comment. 
because the um, response seemed to indicate that much of what he said was was already addressed. So I want to know if this is a new issue or a similar issue that was already raised earlier. Uh, a fair point. That one is a new issue. Uh, I am not personally familiar with what he's referring to. So maybe someone else uh, who's more familiar with what's happening on the site right now could explain yes, the situation. I can, I can speak to that. So the letter um, addresses some comments made by Scott Cashin, who is a biologist that is working for Mr. Franco. And he says, on, on November 9th, 2022, wildlife biologists performed a site visit to the project site. During this visit, he observed and documented a new road and dirt burn that had installed in the western portion of the site. What he's referring to is the Devlin Road extension, which uh, opened earlier this year. And uh, they say that this was not disclosed in the draft EIR. This is a new comment, by the way, not previously raised. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to note for the record, the draft EIR disclosed the Devlin Road extension in three different places in the project description, beginning on page 2-1 of the project description, where we say the city of American Canyon owns an approximately eight acre strip of land that bisects the site north to south. The strip of land would support the planned extension of Devlin Road from Middleton Way to Green Island Road, which was under construction as of summer of 2021. So it's disclosed there. On page 2-3 of this project description, we have a heading called Devlin Road and the Napa Valley Wine Trail Extension Project. And if you'll bear with me, I'll just read briefly. The city of American Canyon adopted a mitigated negative declaration for the Devlin Road and Napa Valley Wine Trail Extension on October 1, 2019. The project consisted of the extension of Devlin Road from Green Island Road to Middleton Way. The extended roadway would have one 14-foot travel lane in each direction and a 12-foot two-way left turn lane. The majority of the 3,084 foot segment would be located within the Gia Bodoni property. On page 2-5, under the heading Devlin Road Extension, as previously discussed, the City of American Canyon is extending Devlin Road approximately 3,084 3, feet linear feet from Green Island Road to Middleton Way. Devlin Road Extension is fully funded. The environmental review process was completed in 2019 and the construction began in 2021. As such, the Devlin Road extension would be completed prior to phase one of the proposed Giovanoni Logistics Center project. And finally, in exhibit 2-3, site photographs, there is a photograph of the under construction Devlin Road project. The draft EIR clearly disclosed the fact that Devlin Road was going to be extended through the site regardless of what happens to this project. And with that, I'll uh, return it back to the Thank you for that clarification. I, I, we're all aware of Devlin Road for those of us who live here in the city. I did not match that Devlin Road was the road that was being um, referred to as the new gravel road in the public comment. So thank you for that clarification. Vice Chair Long, any other comments? Um, um, yes, I mean, just to follow up to the comments from the Center for Biological Diversity, they spoke about the impact of sensitive species and wetlands, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I guess my concern is, is, you know, as a commission and as residents, you know, we are concerned about the environmental impact of all of our, our um, projects. And I understand this process tonight is, is a little different. We're not approving it. We're just providing our recommendation to council. Um, so I, I'm a little, some of these ongoing environmental concerns, how do we, how do we address them? How do they get resolved? Uh, this is the city attorney. Can I comment? Yes, please. All right. Um, I think as Mr. Gruber indicated, you know, there have been uh, several previous uh, final CEQA analysis of this area. I, and I will characterize the comments of Ms. Tinney as general. They're certainly referenced to specific areas of environmental analysis in the existing document with the indication that there will be further clarification uh, in a written written statement to follow uh, with no indication of when it's going to be provided. 
Um, I, I think what you know, Mr. Musa said is relevant, but I'd also you know like Mr. Gruber and the applicants to comment if they feel that any additional time is needed to address issues in the uh, four areas that Miss Tinney was uh, that referred to. You know, again, there's um, you know a, a process in CEQA where we're not supposed to guess about outcomes. We're supposed to base recommendations on substantial evidence, which is what the commission's doing. Uh, but you know, on the one hand, there you know we don't know about what Miss Tinney's going to say in writing. On the on the other hand, there has you know I think it's you know very fair to say that the record shows that there's been significant, repetitive, substantial environmental reviews under CEQA that are final, not subject to judicial review, uh, that have focused on this property. So I think you know a further statement from Mr. Gruber and the applicants would be uh, appropriate as to the record about uh, whether they feel they they would be prejudiced by having the the uh, planning commission go forward on the evidence that's presented and go to the council, understanding that um, it is possible that um, significant new, uh, excuse me, that it, it is possible that there are issues that could be raised by Ms. Tinney or others before the planning commission, or excuse me, before the city council that wouldn't have been heard by the planning commission in making their recommendation today on, I think it's fair to say the record before the commission's extensive. So, you know, one, you know, that's a question to the applicants representatives. And two, I guess it would be to Ms. Tinney about, do you have any time frame as to when you think your written comments that could supplement uh, the general comments that you've made would be made available? So I have two questions as I've just phrased, so. I, I could take the first part. Uh, we feel strongly about our document and the significant analysis that has gone into it, um, you know, to, to hold off because of someone, it frankly is, is threatening to share more information. Uh, we feel that we've done uh, more than an adequate job of, of analyzing uh, the environmental impacts and providing corresponding mitigation. So uh, we do stand by the document that uh, the city has created. And uh, I also defer to our council, but just from the plain view, uh, we have done significant analysis based on, like Mr. Ross has said, uh, years and years of analysis in this area that, um, that frankly, Grant and his company have been at the forefront of. By the way, I'm happy to address any of these comments. Um, with regards to Ms. Tinney and the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, from what I understood, sensitive species she referenced were the Swainson stock. I mentioned that in my presentation, the golden eagle. Uh, again, that's a very similar species to the uh, Swainson stock in terms of it nests in trees. There are no trees on this site. So basically the only potential is for foraging habitat on this site. I would note that Robert Pereira from Huffman Broadway is a biologist who has studied the site. He is available. Should you have any additional comments about or questions about those two species? And also about her comments about wetlands. Greenhouse gas emissions, we used the uh, adopted guidance given by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Um, and we found that we could mitigate greenhouse gas emissions to a level less than significant. As Mr. Leviach in his presentation noted, this project will not have natural gas. This project will be using uh, renewable electricity. This project incorporates many of the features that were recommended by the California Air Resources Board in its letter. Finally, air quality impacts and mitigation. We have not one, but two tables in the draft and the final EIR where we went through the laundry list of mitigation measures submitted by 
uh, Mr. Franco and uh, another organization, the Golden State Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, saying that we need to consider whether or not these are applicable. We did that exercise. It's available, you can read it. And again, we argue it's a good faith analysis because we did adopt three of those mitigation measures and include them in the final EIR. Uh, speaking as the city attorney, I, I think one area that I think is worth pointing out to the commission is Mr. Gruber represented or commented upon the VMT analysis. And um, I think it's important to note that prior to doing that uh, in the document, I believe it begins at page 583 as it appears in the record before the commission, that this, the uncertainty about how to apply that analysis, but there are various sources to perform that so that the full information is for the commission, including a modified level of service analysis, which was the previous method employed to assess traffic impacts, which was accomplished in all the prior environmental documents referenced that cover this site. So I think that's significant. So I think basically it's down to members of the commission, if there are questions where you think additional information might be helpful, uh, if you could phrase those, I think that would be beneficial to both the applicant and staff. Um, our review would indicate that unless there's more specificity advanced at this time, that both because of the procedure and timing of the environmental review, more, more than adequate time has been allotted for public comment, both at the NOP stage and at the draft stage than normally is the case, right? And, but, you know, this is the time. So if you feel, you know, before making a recommendation to the council that you have questions about what's been presented, um, I think that now's the time to advance them and, you know, get a response from staff and or the applicant. Thanks. I wonder if I could just jump in uh, one more time on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I feel underdressed. I didn't know everyone was going to be wearing a tie. I, I am an attorney. That may not look like it. <laughs> now, doing CEQA and CEQA litigation for 37 years. And likely if this one would go to court, would, would be in charge of defending the CIR. I'm very familiar with Mr. Franco's firm and also the Center for Biological Diversity. It's very common on, on literally the, uh, the day of a planning commission hearing or even after a planning commission hearing prior to a city uh, council hearing or a board of supervisors hearing for voluminous comments of this uh, nature to be uh, provided to the uh, CEQA lead agency. It's kind of a, a common tactic to try to delay uh, the project. Uh, Part of my job is going to be to, to very carefully review anything that comes in. And if my honest assessment is that there's a legal vulnerability uh, that's identified by uh, one of these parties, uh, I would bring that to the attention of the city and uh, would advocate that any problem be addressed because I wouldn't be doing Mr. Leviach any, any favors recommending going forward with an EIR that could be successfully challenged in court. But to see this sort of uh, avalanche of new new comments at the, at the last minute is, you know, for good or ill, something that happens almost every day of the week, it seems like somewhere around California. Logistics projects are kind of the flavor of the month for opposition from some of the environmental groups and labor unions these days. So we would intend to study this very carefully, but there is time between now and the city council meeting. And if, if there are points that truly have merit, I would you know, tell Mr. Ross, I thought that was the case. And if we had to you know, do more work, then I would suggest we should do more work. But right now, I don't, I don't honestly think that uh, they've raised any fatal flaws based on what I've seen from this letter uh, that we do have this evening. Thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Vice Chair Ross. Um, and I, I do appreciate all of the comments and, and the responses we have we have been getting. Um, and and I think it's just this is a public hearing and we want to make sure that we give everyone who's 
you know, attended a chance to make sure that their comments were heard and responded to. Um, I did have a question of my own. I know it's been mentioned that there's going to be a 45 acre preservation area. And then I think it was in one of the slide decks. It talked about in phase one, 65% would go to conservation. And I think it was stated 30% overall. How does that, that must of course be in addition to the 45 acres? Cause that seems like a rel relatively small number. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. That is may that have the been, same that number? May been, that may have been confusing. Um, so the phase one project specific uh, site plan that you have in front of you tonight, uh, I believe is about 70 acres. And what we what we intend to do is to establish the wetland preserve with phase one, uh, mitigate for phase one impacts by creating wetlands within that 45 acre preserve. We would also overbuild wetlands for potential additional impacts in phase two. So that 45 acres uh, would not change. It's still 30% of the 156 of what we deem as, as developable. Uh, it's just a reference to of what we are improving with phase one, uh, nearly 65% of the land cover is dedicated to conservation. Knowing that uh, that number of 45 acre wetland preserve, that'll, that'll stick, right? We're, we're, not, uh, we're not doing more than that. It was just to highlight uh, mm -hmm. much of phase one is going to uh, preservation as well as uh, creation within that that overall 45 acre area that will uh, be protected in, in perpetuity through a conservation easement. And so, and that is part of your agreement with the owners of the property because I understand you have a hundred year land lease. So they will honor that beyond the land lease or does that only last during the land lease. No, that that conservation area will will remain open space in in perpetuity. That that is what we uh, deem as is not developable land, and so uh, our structure is, is based on uh, the developable land within uh, the overall two hundred eight acre site. Okay, so that will so that will always be open space Correct. in perpetuity. Correct. Okay. I was curious, can you show us, I know you had diagrams up and you outlined um, the different roads and everything, but I, I miss seeing where on the property, the 45 acre um, open space would be. Um, yeah, maybe we can go to this, just the site plan from yeah, one moment. Um, you get yeah. There. And would it be possible as well to get Mr. I don't know if this is possible, but I just want to make sure Mr. Franco is aware that the road he's talking about is Devlin Road as well to close that as a, because that's a pretty significant, Devlin Road is like a main road, not an unnamed gravel road. I don't know if we can do that during, as part of the public hearing or not, Chair Malari. Oh, we would have to open up public comment again. Um, that's Map is up. We could just point it out. That's the case, but I don't believe that. Are we sharing? We are. Sorry. Oh, can uh, Commissioner Wong? Can you see my my mouse here? And yes. I'm sorry, we don't have a graphic. It's in our our lot line adjustment in our tentative map. But uh, basically, our 45 acres will follow this dotted line here. Phase one come across Devlin, jot up a little bit, come down this protected area, basically everything here. So this is your, your 45 acre wetland preserve, uh, basically most of the Northern section of, of the site. I'm very excited to see such a large corridor being protected. Um, I have a question, and this isn't my area of expertise, but is it possible to have a corridor crossing for the wildlife across for them uh, to cross safely? Because that's going to be a busy road for them to cross. 
it's great it's there, but how do they navigate it? There are culverts under Devlin for drainage, but um, I do have Robert Ferreira, our biologist, so I think could speak to that um, probably more eloquently than I can. Sure. <clears throat> sure, there is technically a corridor for smaller terrestrial animals. There's a fairly large culvert that goes under um, this extension. It's right right about where your cursor is, Joe, a little yeah. bit higher. Little, right. I, think I think it's right about there. So uh, water animals will be able to move back and forth. Obviously, deer won't be able to. You know, foxes will be able to go under there. Coyotes will be able to go under there. Deer might have to go over the road. But in general, wildlife will be able to go from one end to the other. And then when you get to the far um, northwest corner, it's kind of the same situation. There's a fairly large culvert that goes under that road that eventually goes to um, the Napa Logistics Wetland Preserve. And so there's a hydrologic connection uh, between the two sites and wildlife can go back and forth uh, through the culvert. Again, maybe deer might have to go over the road, you know, but uh, smaller average size terrestrial animals should be able to move back and forth uh, between the areas. Is, is there any possibility of putting an underground corridor for the deer? Uh, well, that would have to be a pretty big, well, the Devlin Road extension is already in, so you couldn't do something like that. And, and then the culvert at the end is already in also. It would have to be a pretty big opening. Um, I know they do corridors for, like that for uh, for cattle, uh, but they're pretty large. So you, I, I don't think you can do something like that. So, you know, things like deer will have to uh, move across the road, which... Um, you know, to get back and forth. Okay. Well, thank you um, for showing me the planned area on the um, on the map. Um, that will be a, a nice a nice feature to have. I was also excited to see in your documentation that the buildings will be dual plumbed for recycled water as well, which is something I'd love to see more of our new residential development have, but I understand it's, it's not allowed yet. So that was great to see as well. Um, well, I've asked a bunch of questions. So maybe I'll give my other fellow commissioners a chance and and maybe um, there might be a possibility we could go back to um, seeing if there's more public comment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Wong. Commissioner Gong. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question really has to do with wetlands as, as well. <clears throat> the image that was just shown in the southwestern portion of what would be phase two of this project, there's a significant area of wetlands there, yet that's not included in the 45 acres. Is there a plan on either saving that portion of wetlands or is that being mitigated by the 45 acres that are being established on the northern part of the property? sir. If that wetland is impacted right now with uh, in the EIR, we have that large wetland um, impacted, the whole site's built out. So if it does get impacted, we will uh, mitigate for that within the 45 acre site. And so we're anticipating that um, that wetland, that large wetland will be impacted. So we're actually overbuilding, the plan is to overbuild um, our wetland establishment in that 45 acre area mm -hmm. to create the wetlands now in anticipation of them being impacted. It may or may not get impacted once the final project is built, but we're anticipating that it will. And so we're gonna create the wetlands, we're gonna preserve the 45 acres. If that project never gets built or it's built differently and you don't impact that area, the wetlands will still be preserved. The wetlands will still be built. The 45 acre wetland preserve will still be a preserve. So it's it's a risk that Buzz Oats is taking by spending the money and overbuilding these wetlands, which will create great habitat. Um, so it, they will be mitigated on that 45 acre site. And everything will tie in nicely to the existing Napa logistics wetland preserve. My other question, I only have one other question. It really goes back to vehicle miles, miles traveled. Um, there was a comment about truck 
vehicle miles traveled. Um, and I'm uncertain if that is based on perspective or possible tenants to the buildings and the matter of truck traffic they will bring in and out, or is that truck traffic based on just the building of and the development of the site? Well, obviously it's gonna be user driven, but you can you can ex extrapolate trends, right, on, on logistics facilities overall. And when you look at, you know, the Napa region, American Canyon, uh, that those those truck trips aren't the same length that you would see in the Central Valley in Sacramento. Um, and so looking at the entire Bay Area, when we actually took the raw data, th these aren't projections, right? These are these are facilities uh, throughout the Bay Area that we looked at and uh, what we're showing of actual trips within American Canyon as compared to the rest of the Bay Area that those those trips are nearly, I think it was 39%, nearly 40% lower than the Bay Area average. Yeah, and again, my question really goes to that. If you look at Napa County truck vehicle miles traveled, especially in American Canyon, um, those numbers aren't really indicative of a lot of other industries because it's all wine storage. And in wine storage, you come in, you store, and then at some point in time, it's going out. Um, so depending on the tenants, that number may not be very accurate. That's kind of my question there. Yeah, you know, the, the other thing with that um, that I don't think was highlighted probably to the extent, uh, we do have rail access to this site as well. And so we have had interest from tenants already. Uh, again, we obviously can't... Uh, <laughs> Can't cite tenants here yet, right. but they have inquired about uh, the accessibility to rail and having that as uh, really a, a locational feature that you can't really find, um, generally speaking, throughout the Bay Area near these type of corridors. So you're right that it it um, it is always user driven, right? But what we found in the aggregate um, that these trips are lower. And we also have the ability with access to rail that some of those trips can't could be offset by uh, the utilization of rail. I guess um, one more question. Sure. Uh, um, and it really has to do with the environmental attributes you talked about in the project, which overall were outstanding. I noticed that you're building the structure with um, the ability to add solar onto the roof, but there's no intention at this point in time to put solar up there. Uh, that is a that is a condition of approval uh, that the buildings shall be served with solar energy on site. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Malari. I wanted to uh, just point out that um, there is a condition of approval with respect to overall trips. Um, a trip monitoring program that's modeled off for, after uh, the Napa Logistics Park. So, um, you know, there's assumptions that are made in the environment impact report and the environmental impacts are come from that, but there's a recognition that the site could evolve over time. And, and so um, there's a trip monitoring program that monitors trips on the site based upon what the EIR assumed. Mm -hmm. And there's different programs and things to help reduce trips um, and then a fail safe um, program in the event that they aren't successful. So that's worked very well for the Napa Logistics Park. Um, and, and we assume the same would occur here. Yeah. I, um, if I may, uh, I'm just, um, thank you for the presentation and, um, and all the work that's gone on behind this. Um, it's, it's been a long time coming, I know. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think this is, um, going to be a great benefit. I really like the concept of the vehicle traffic being separated between the trucks and, and the vehicle of the workers there. And the potential of of uh, you know what could all go on there, and I think it will be a, a big enhancement to the city overall. Um, I I don't have too any real deep questions except um, 
except to the lead status of the building. I mean, it seems very sustainable. You've got all of that, but it's it. I don't recall any th seeing anything about uh, lead standard. Is is that in the works, or did I miss that? Uh, we are be building to lead standards, and I, I think our architect's probably better uh, first in this than me. Even though I did write my grad school thesis on lead certification and uh, cost benefit analysis, uh, Cal Green is is basically turning into what what lead was, right? So these are things that uh, we are doing um, tier two EV charging, you know the the no VOC coatings. Uh, bicycle racks, showers. I, I know it's a checklist, uh, but we, we are building to these standards. Whether we will pursue certification, I believe, is is something that's to be determined. But uh, maybe Jeff Lenhart can speak to some of the kind of attributes as to what what goes into that there. Yeah, I I really see Calgary, as Joe said, as a as really the premier uh, standard for sustainability moving into the future because it's mandatory and it affects all projects certainly on commercial projects. And in tier one, Cal Green uh, measures up to lead certification almost as an equivalent. There, there's a few things in Cal Green that aren't in lead, and there's a few things in lead that aren't in Cal Green because they're not exactly the same system. But essentially, once you've reached your compliance with tier one Cal Green, you've reached a level of sustainability that would qualify you almost without exception to attain lead certification. Tier two Cal Green, which is usually not uh, um, pursued um, and, and certainly not for the type of projects of this type, um, goes beyond that. And certainly in the realm of the electrical vehicle charging stations being installed and not just EV ready is a, is a pretty high threshold for an industrial project, a logistics project such as this, advanced manufacturing. Um, I think there's a, you know, in spite of there not being a, a concrete commitment to lead certification on this project, I think there's still a very strong sustainability story to be made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think with what we're uh, committing to, you know, lead certification or not, I, I would be hard pressed to find anyone else that's going to be doing what we're doing. I mean, really, from, you know, right. the charging, no natural gas, on-site solar, um, you know, like you mentioned, the design features of, I know it's a site issue of, of separating truck and, and auto traffic, but uh, we really think that we are going above and beyond here. Okay, and um, and when we uh, get to public comment, uh, uh, just to note to the public, there there um, was a, a document sent today um, by, I see uh, one of the attendees, so it'd be good to hear from that attendee. Um, when we go to public comment. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Navarro. Um, I just had two questions, and this is more into, I think I might answer the first question, but you mentioned the high quality tenants. Um, if you build it, they will come. Please, please. May not say that, but how do you um, how do you seek those high quality tenants? Um, and then also in regards to the longevity of having a business here in American Canyon, uh, when signing the lease and sending that over, is there a certain minimum of uh, years that you are looking to have the, um, a the, the tenant there, or is there a minimum or some type of requirement that? Um, but those are anything that have to be instilled with the many years of services that you get to them? Yeah, it's it's multifaceted as far as how we how we find our tenants. Um, we have over 200 existing tenants, right? And so a lot of that is, you know, I mentioned regional consolidation of you'll have a company with a building in Vacaville, a building in Napa, you know, maybe Fairfield, and they want to they want to consolidate all of those disparate operations into one larger building right that's that's one thing that we've been seeing uh, we, we certainly work with the brokerage community on uh, locating those tenants we work with 
economic development departments locally. We work with the state economic development group. Uh, so there's a whole host of ways how we how we find tenants, and many times, uh, you know, site selectors they will say we want to be here for this reason, right? A lot of times, okay, we want to attract these type of industries, uh, but the 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 data analytics that goes into where a company should be, ultimately, you know, sometimes they come to us, right? And so there's not there's not a one size fits all there, but I think um, with the high quality buildings that that we do build, uh, we do attract high quality tenants. I mean, I mentioned two thirds are national tenants and a, a third mix of regional and local, uh, but we don't we don't sign leases with everyone that knocks on our door. You know, we have um, an investment committee that approves these things. We have a pretty strict underwriting, right, on, on how uh, we analyze credit. And so uh, we are selective in that, and we are, we are fortunate to be in a position to uh, sometimes pass on tenants that we don't feel are the best fit for the building or community. So uh, again, I'm sorry there's not a, a one size fits all answer there, but it's, you know, it's existing relationships. Um, it's leveraging, you know, workforce within a community. And um, ultimately we feel that we have a, a strong tenant mix now. What uh, what other part of the question did I miss? I'm sorry. I think you, you, you tackled it. And how, how we find the high quality tenants and then if there's a, a minimum of your- Oh, a lease. You know, typically a, a, a just a standard lease is, you know, three to five years, seven years. Sometimes you get a 10 year lease depending on that. But uh, yeah, we, we like longer leases, right? It, it's less turnover in buildings. And, um, you know, if we could, if we could get a 10 year lease out of clients or even longer, 15, 20, certainly we like that. It's, I think sometimes the users want to have that flexibility of, as, as they expand, uh, that they have the ability to either consolidate like within the park, uh, you know, that they could further expand there or, uh, they just have that flexibility to remain nimble. So yeah, an average seven year lease say, uh, we like, we like longer leases, but, um, it is always user driven and site specific. Great. Thank you. That's all the comments that I had. I want to thank you for the presentation. I get it very well put, but very well presented. Um, and appreciate the time that you guys came to meeting with us today. Um, thank you. There was a recommendation to open up public comment uh, again, uh, and I will go forth and open up public comment. Nicole, can you take a look and see if you have any? Yes, so this is a second call for public comment on this item. Okay, I have Richard Franco. Um, I will ask him to unmute. Mr. Franco, you have three minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify my prior comments. I'm well aware of the Devlin Road extension. The new road I was referring to is not the Devlin Road extension. It is in the, it starts in the northwest corner of the site near where No Name Creek leaves the site. And it goes all the way across from north to south and it ends near the southern boundary of the site at the railroads, railroad tracks. So there's uh, images that we provided in the comments we, we provided today. Um, both of my consultants have provided images. If you look at my, the, the, the comments that were provided today um, on page 37 of the PDF uh, overlays the new uh, images of the satellite images of the new road over the, uh, some of the, the wetlands site plan and Mr. Cashin, you know, the, uh, the wildlife biologist also provided a, a Google satellite image uh, at page 61 on the PDF. It's clearly not Dublin Road. I know what Dublin Road is and this is something new. I, I, I don't know what it is and I was hoping to get an explanation from, um, from folks tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, Grant can speak to the uh, new sewer alignment that was part of Napa Logistics and their certified EIR um, that has a, 
an easement to it uh, that was already part of a, a further project that is not relevant to, to this one here. Just for Don't a point of clarification. Yeah, help. Kind of an image from the NAP Logistics EIR. Not sure how clearly it's going to, okay. I won't try to do it, but this is the uh, sewer alignment and uh, recycled water alignment that was installed throughout the western portion that was contemplated by the Napa Logistics Project. And this is a certified EIR. It was issued in 2015, certified in 2015. So this is not a secret. It's been on the books for a while. And apparently it's, it was, it's been constructed recently or within the past year or so. So if uh, you want a reference, it's exhibit 2-9-A of the Napa Logistics Park Phase 2 Project Environmental Impact Report. But yes, this has been previously evaluated by the city. In fact, we had a number of mitigation measures that were specifically for the uh, utility alignment. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. Um, Erica, do you, do you have your microphone on here? Were they referring to the sewer main on the phase two portion of the property, which is the far west on the west side of Devlin Road that's now built? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm referring to that. No, the, the person making the comment, Mr. Franco. If he's not familiar with it. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I don't know what it is. That's why I brought it to the attention of, of the commission tonight. It, it My consultant went out and saw what clearly appeared to be a, a gravel road with associated earth disturbance on either side of it that runs through the proposed wetlands mitigation area that clearly appears to impact areas that are slated for wetland mitigation. Like they're gonna create wetlands mitigation on area that's already been compacted and disturbed. So uh, if it's a sewer line, I'm not sure why there's a road built on top of it, a gravel road, but it, it's um, that we're, we're raising it because it appears to be a new development that needs to be evaluated and it clearly would affect the ability uh, to create uh, wetlands mitigation in this area. We do know that all wetlands <laughs> have been staked and there haven't been any impact to any existing wetlands. And that improvement was part of another project's certified EIR. So uh, again, I think last minute, this has been a project that was approved uh, years ago, and now those improvements have been made. We do know that our biologists, both NAPA logistics biologists and our biologists coordinated uh, the staking of any wetlands and no existing wetlands have been impacted. So if there were temporary uh, roads on upland areas, uh, I can't speak to what Mr. Franco is saying, but again, those improvements were already contemplated a long time ago. Thank you for the response. Uh, ensure that we have public comment that we can respond back and close up on Um Okay, so if anybody else has public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Nobody is raising their hand, Chair Malari. Perfect, thank you. I'll go ahead and close the public comment. Um, Erica, did you have a comment? I just wanted to clarify for Planning Commission, Erica Cities, Public Works Director, City Engineer, um, if, if the gravel road they're referring to is the new force main that was part of the Napa Logistics Park project, um, that has been completed. It was accepted by council earlier this year, approximately a month ago now. Um, you have to have a maintenance road as part of that easement to maintain our sewer main. So um, as has been already conveyed before by the developers, this is all permitted work that's been approved and uh, would not have taken place without the appropriate regulatory properties and the uh, environmental uh, approval. So thank you. Any other comments from the commissioners? 
looking for any recommendations on the three resolutions that we have ahead of us today. I, I will move to um, to approve the um, to approve this project. I know we don't have a resolution to read off of. Um, I think Director Cooper emailed us something. Yes, there is. A, I sent an email with the re, the uh, first resolution to recommend uh, the City Council certify the environmental impact report um, later this afternoon. Uh, the resolution title is um, included in the staff report recommendation. Okay. Mr. Navarro, I have it open if you'd like me to okay, do it. Okay, go ahead. You can make it. So I'll make a motion to approve the resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California, recommending the City Council, one, certify the final rep environmental impact report um sch 20210101104 item two adopt sequel findings for a fact item three adopt a statement of overriding considerations and item four adopt a mitigated monitoring and reporting program for the geo Givanini logistics center project located north of green island road and bisected by the devlin road that is APN 057-090-008 and 057-1300-0. And 057-1300-0. That is file number PL20-0042. How to do? I second. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Goff. Aye. Commissioner Navarro. Aye. Commissioner, or excuse me, Vice Chair Wong. Aye. And Chair uh, Mawari. Aye. Thank you. Moving on to finding a recommendation um, for resolution of the second bullet item for the City Council to approve the Giovanni Logistics Center Phase 1. I'll make a motion to um, find a resolution of resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California, recommending the City Council of the City of American Canyon approve the Giovanni Logistics Center Phase One Design Permit to allow up to uh, 1069904 square foot, uh, feet of high cube warehouse uses on 70.2 acres located north of Green Island Road and east of Devlin Road, APN 057 090 008, 057 and 057 130 36, file number PL. Two zero dash zero zero four two. I will second. <clears throat> Commissioner Goff, roll call. Yes, uh, Commissioner Goff. Aye. Commissioner Navarro. Aye. Commissioner Altman is absent. Vice Chair Wong. Aye. Chair Malari. Aye. Moving along, looking for a recommendation for bullet number three. I uh, I will uh, recommend uh, to move forward with the resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California. The uh, City Council of American Canyon approved the Giovannini Logistics Center tentative partial map to create a two-lot subdivision for up to 1,069,904 square feet of high cube warehouse uses on 7.2 acres located north of Green Island Road and east of Devlin Road, APN 057-090-008 and 057-130-034 
and 057-130-036, file number PL 20-0043. I will also second. Yes, Commissioner Goff. Aye. Commissioner Navarro. Aye. Commissioner Altman is absent, Vice Chair Wong. Aye. And Chair Malare. Thank you. All right, moving on to active planning projects. Uh, feel free to stay on or by all means. Um, see you in, on the next round. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Director Cooper, the floor is all yours. Great. Where'd everybody go? This is the fun part. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it just highlights uh, of activities in the community development department um, and um, kind of on our list here, um, the Hampton Inn Hotel, which was approved by the Planning Commission and City Council a little more than a year ago, um, they applied for an extension of their entitlement, um, which staff has approved. And uh, they intend to submit their building permit um, possibly before the end of the calendar year. So I know that was a, a project over there uh, just south of um, uh, Donaldson Way at Highway 29, had a lot of design considerations, um, a lot of features I think that we're all very proud of. It's nice to see um, that one uh, moving forward to construction. So um, that's uh, coming up soon um, for all of us. Um, the uh, Watson Ranch specific plan amendment um, had a meeting today with the applicant and staff um, and a council appointed subcommittee uh, and the city attorney. Um, the application is still evolving a little bit. Um, had some good um, discussion. Uh, we expect to get a little modified um, uh, to the plan proposal and then um, we'll be um, doing our doing some outreach on that. And ultimately, it'll be going to all the commissions and the planning committee uh, as a recommendation to the city council. A specific plan is adopted by ordinance. So that's um, something that is approved by the city council. But there is no change to the overall number of dwelling units. There's kind of some reconfiguration, um, taking a look at the specific plan, kind of streamlining it a bit. Um, and now that it's, it's up and running, um, so we're kind of looking forward to uh, bringing that to you um, in the new year. Um, let's see, the uh, Chicken Guy restaurant staff has um, had one review um, that was sent into the applicant. Um, we've had some uh, a meeting with uh, the applicant and expect we'll be um, uh, getting a resubmittal for that fairly soon. Um, let's see, the uh, residences at Napa Junction, this is an, a, a proposed apartment project of 453 units. It's uh, north of Tractor Supply and the Canyon Ridge Apartments. They're um, what we call the balloon property um, of the railroad lines that are there today. And there are some that were once there. Um, we have um, a cultural resource um, review of the um, historical railroad firms that are there and having a peer review. We expect to get that peer review report fairly soon. Um, and uh, we've had two staff reviews um, of the project and are awaiting the applicant to resubmit. So um, lots kind of cooking um, on that one for sure. Um, we have an application called Sun Square Mixed Use Project. This is a, um, a fairly small project uh, about half an acre it's um, off of Napa Junction Road um, next to Walmart. Um, so if you think about you know, Walmart and you on Napa Junction Road, you go a little further past the parking lot, it's the kind of lot there with two uh, single story homes. Um, and that's a proposal for uh, 20 apartments uh, and some office space. So it's kind of a little niche project. It's kind of neat um, to see 
And um, the application was submitted back in 2021. The applicant put it on hold for about six months and they've come back with some new um, ideas for it. So it's, it's coming along, but it's a, a nice little unusual project for us. Um, we have, uh, let's see, the uh, building code update. Um, this is uh, once every three years. Uh, and um, the city council on Tuesday approved a second reading. Um, it'll be effective in, in time for January 1st when the new, new building codes take effect throughout the state. So um, that's uh, kind of a little milestone there, which is nice to see. Um, coming up in January, um, staff uh, presents to the city council um, an update on our cannabis businesses. Um, and so um, that's scheduled for January 17th. And um, if I could scoop it, we have uh, one business that's moving forward off of Dodd Cord and two um, are still languishing and trying to sort out uh, where they'll be and another one has a dispute with the property owner. So it's not a lot different than it was a year ago. So um, Council doesn't mind me scooping the uh, update for you. Um, we reached another milestone um, earlier this week. Uh, our housing element was sent to the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you for participating with the council on October 18th on a workshop. And so it's now in the capable hands of the State Housing and Community Development. So they have 90 days. Um, I would consider success a letter that has 15 or fewer pages. Uh, most cities get a very extensive letter, but we have a lot going for us because uh, already planning for future growth in the city. I'm hoping HC likes that. Um, and then speaking of housing, um, our building inspector just this afternoon informed me that he has approved um, for the opening of um, model homes, first ones, in uh, Watson Ranch. Um, this is a subdivision that's off the end of Summerwood. And uh, so that's a nice, a nice milestone. Um, and um, so those are, oh, oh, and then another thing coming up in the new year, um, based upon our conversation that we had also uh, with the council on October 18th, is staff is going to be bringing in the new year an update to our public hearing notice requirements to widen our um, uh, notice radius that receives the, the paper notifications. Um, we've already implemented one of the recommendations, and we did that for Chicken Guy, um, where we have our gov delivery distribution list, which is very, very broad. And so um, uh, we put that on out of gov, gov delivery for the uh, application submittal and um, got, got more comments than we normally do. So that's um, pretty nice to see. And then finally, I just got to say, you know, with all of the planning commission applications we have, it's it's clear that it's cool to be on the planning commission. No question about that. And and you probably would agree it's kind of fun too. And that's my update for you today. Vice Chair Mom. Um. Thank you, Chair Mullary. Well, thank you, Director Cooper, for the report. It's always great to hear what's happening in our city. I had a question. When do you think um, chicken, the Chicken Guy application may come to our little forum here? Hmm. Um, we had a, a, a really good first review and uh, also a good response from the applicant. I know in meetings we've had since then, a lot of the comments were discussed. <laughs> And uh, a lot of the issues that we raised, the applicant understood them, was willing to make some modifications. So I'm kind of hoping that after we get the resubmittal, it'll be pretty close to being brought back to the to the planning commission. Hopefully in January is my hope. Okay, excellent. And I was just curious. I keep, I looked for Oat Hill on our active list, but I didn't hmm. see anything. And I know you explained there was this kind of phase where they kind of drop off. But I thought maybe you might <laughs> want to give us an update if there is one. Um, the applicant does intend to begin grading soon, um, and and so that should be happening very very soon. Um, 
I believe the grading permits are all permitted mm -hmm. and ready to go, um, weather permitting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was wondering when uh, Circle K is going to be um, operating. It looks like a lot of progress has been made. Yeah, it's just outside my office, so I get to watch it every day. Um, and I've got to say, it's it's this is going to be the nicest looking Circle K in the world. <laughs> no question. It's okay. Um, but um, they are apparently having a little trouble um, getting electrical service from PG&E. Mm. That has really delayed their progress. Mm. It's, okay. it's the critical path to them opening. So um, I, I, I think um, the guess is sometime in the new year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I noticed the car wash withdrew their application. Mm -hmm. Did they give you a reason why? Um, I haven't talked to them personally, so I, I, I don't know the, the actual reason, um, but I have a suspect that one of the really critical issues having to do with um, using recycled water only, I mean, that was something they explained. It's like, oh, well, you know, our quality, and I have no doubt they're true, um, needed potable water, and that just wasn't something that um, our ordinances would have allowed uh, the site. So I think that may be a, a miscommunication somewhere along the way that was that was made clear through the workshop. And and you know if if there's something that is important to hear, um, I really want our applicants to know what it is, good or bad, because it's not something I that we want to see happen at the end of a process. We want to front end whatever it is there to be told. I want I want people to know that up front. And then they can make up their mind what they want to do from there. So thank you for, for having that workshop. And um, important, important, especially given the stage we're at with water, especially here in the city, you know, and just everything going on. It, it, I think it was a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any uh, commissioner items? Well, I don't think we'll be having a meeting in December. So this oh. is the last one, I think, of the calendar year. Oh, okay. And I know that we're at the end of some terms, perhaps. What? Um, some of you might be reappointed. Who knows? There's a big field. But I, I want to say just how much I've enjoyed uh, working with all of you this year, whether you're, you know, up for renewal or not. <laughs> it's a really great um, group to work with and I'm, I deeply appreciate the time that you take to go through and consider all of these applications with the level of detail that you do. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm enormously grateful. Well, thanks, Brett. I, I've learned so much from you and from all of you because I'm not reapplying. So this then is my last meeting. So, um, so, and thank you, Nicole, for all your support. You're always in the background helping. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Brent, just all your, your leadership and guidance, be you and William. Mm -hmm. um, but um, this has been a, a real honor and, and pleasure and a learning experience. And I'll be checking in online and coming in person uh, once that starts happening regular. So you'll see me around. Thank you. Well, Tyrone, I know you were, you've been very helpful to me during my first, you know, I guess my first four years. I remember you talked with me even before I applied and, you know, and I, I did reapply. So we'll wait to see what happens, but I have enjoyed the four years and Brent, it was definitely, as you said, mm -hmm. if you want to know what's happening, mm -hmm. come to planning commission. I always stress to so many people who expressed to me, their opinions about development and how did this or that happen. I'm like, you gotta come to planning commission. That's where it's all happening. Um, I, I always try and share with people, they don't realize what an opportunity they are giving up by not coming to planning commission meetings, city council meetings, and you know, and other city 
meetings where, you know, residents can give input. So it has been a very good four years and I definitely learned a lot. Yeah. And hopefully I'll see you guys in January, but we'll see. Yes, Commissioner Goff and I are input, so. <laughs> Still hanging on. Yeah. Hang in there. <laughs> Keep doing the good work. But definitely a pleasure. Uh, we will see who the uh, council selects, uh, elects for planning commission, but always a pleasure being part of all these conversations and just knowing the growth and the strength that uh, our residents have, our community has, and kind of where we're taking community or the, the city, um, you know, and kind of being responsible in the development and the continuous growth and diversity um, changes that we see. Um, not just in American Canyon, but also in our county and worldwide. So I enjoy working with you all. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Everybody have a safe weekend following into the holidays, um, and we will see you again in 2023. Take care. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye.